Hello, and thanks for tuning in to the NYC Schools Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Nancy Reback Altadonna, and you are listening to Episode 5. This is an episode that is Part 2 of a three-part series about media literacy and digital citizenship. Episode 5 of the NYC Schools Tech Podcast features Michelle Chula Lipkin, the Executive Director of the National Association for Media Literacy Education. As Executive Director, Michelle has helped Namely grow to be the preeminent media literacy education association in the U.S. She launched the first ever Media Literacy Week in the U.S., developed strategic partnerships with media companies such as Participant Media, Nickelodeon, and Twitter, and restructured both the governance and membership of the organization. She has also overseen three national conferences and done countless appearances at conferences in the media field regarding the importance of media literacy. Since 2017, Michelle has advocated for greater media literacy education through CNN, PBS NewsHour, NPR, The New York Times, and Al Jazeera English. Michelle began her career in children's television production in various roles on both corporate and production teams. She earned both her undergraduate and graduate degrees from New York University. Michelle focused her grad work on children and television, where she caught the media literacy bug. After graduate school, Michelle worked as a facilitator for The Lamp, learning about multimedia projects teaching media literacy and production classes for pre-kindergarten to fifth grade students. Michelle is currently an adjunct lecturer at Brooklyn College in the TV radio department where she teaches media criticism and media literacy. Hi, Michelle. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, thank you so much for being on the NYC Schools Tech Podcast. You were the first person that I thought of when I came up with the idea of having a theme for media literacy based upon uh, meeting you at the PBS PD event on digital citizenship and media literacy. That's were- awesome. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yes, thank you so much for being here. So, Michelle, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about your organization and so namely is the national association for media literacy education and i'm the executive director namely is a national nonprofit, and we're a nonpartisan organization we are a membership organization it's free for individuals and our mission is to see media literacy be highly valued and widely practiced around the country. And how we do that is we have our community of members, which is over 4,400 members around the country in every state. I'm really proud of that in every state. (laughs) Uh, And we have a group of organizational partners. There's about 45 of them. And essentially what we see ourselves as is the, the networker, the convener, the resource, the thought leader, kind of think of us as the umbrella organization for media literacy education around the country. And we do conferences, regional events, we publish the Journal for Media Literacy Education, and we really are doing everything we can to move media literacy forward and really support the work that's being done in classrooms around the country. Would you give your elevator pitch on what media literacy is and what media literacy education is? So media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act using all forms of communication. So if you think of media literacy as an expanded definition of traditional literacy, that's really what it is, right? What does it mean to be literate in the 21st century in the digital age? We say it's media literate. Media literacy education is how do we teach it? How do we teach these skills? What support do our students need? What supports do our teachers need? And what support do families need, right? This is not a, media literacy isn't a skill that should be taught only in school. It's really a lifelong skill, especially with the ever-changing media and information landscape. We all have to be learning media literacy skills throughout our lives. So why do you students need to learn media literacy and digital citizenship? 
media are such a huge part of our lives today. And so I think it's a pretty simple reason. We are spending more time with media than we are at home, than we are uh, sometimes asleep, and certainly than we are at school. So if media are going to play such a big role in our lives, we need to make sure that we have the skills to use that media and create and participate with that media in a really effective way, right? So you have to imagine right now, if you think of just the teenagers today, they're spending about nine to 10 hours of uh, time every day with media. That's a huge amount of their day. And what are they doing on that media? How are they learning on that media? What can we do to help them engage with that media? What can they teach us about the media, right? There's so many things we need to be thinking about. But the why of digital citizenship and media literacy is really media are ubiquitous. And we need to prioritize the skills that we need to succeed in the world uh, that we live in. And this world is filled with media and filled with digital tools. And we need to know how to really thrive in that environment. Media is a broad word. Absolutely. What do you define media as? And is there a difference between your definition of media and what you think young people see as media? Well, I think it, it, what's interesting is that even when I when I give the statistic that uh, teenagers are using about 10 hours of media a day, everyone's just stunned by that. But w as soon as you say, well, music is media, right? And books are media, all our newspapers and our magazines, like media are all around us. And when you really start to break down, media are the the bus ads that we see and the, you know, the TV that we're seeing when we walk into a store, right? Media are everywhere. So I think that people forget that music and books, like this is all, this is all media. Advertising, still advertising, it, it's all media. I think that a lot of people look at just like the iPhone as media or the television screen, but even the even films, when you go to a movie theater, that's media, right? It's all around us. And so when you start to break down all the different things that could be, that are considered media, you start to realize like, well, actually, it's not that hard to spend 10 hours a day using it because so many things are within that definition. I'm glad that I, that I asked for a clarification. 10 hours does sound like a lot, but when you break it down to how many sources of media we face in a daily basis, 10 hours isn't actually all that much. You um, also have to think about, like, certainly in New York City, if you think about, I have a 14 and a 16-year-old at home, and they are constantly listening to music, right? They have their earbuds in at all times, on the way to school, on the way home, and that adds up. These kids are commuting a long time to school, right? So you start to break it down. You're like, oh, it makes sense. So what's the risk if, if our students are, are not not media literate what are the are, are are there risks well i think that if we really embrace this idea that media literacy is an expanded definition of literacy then you could look at this as the same question as what is the risk of people not being literate and we know at this point in our culture and in our world that there's huge risk in a literacy right that 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 it's a it people are at it an incredible disadvantage if they are not literate and they cannot really succeed in the world without literacy <laughs> so if you think about that then there is great risk in a media saturated world and in a digital world for students and people of all ages to not be media literate. And if we really think of media literacy as a skill that is parallel to foundational literacy, or, you know, if you think of foundational literacy as the start in some ways, although that's tricky too, right? Because kids are on devices before they can read. So media literacy must start at a very, very young age. Back to the, the question at hand, though, I think there's great risk. And the risk is the same exact risk when we were exploring literacy as a, as a country, right, and as a world. And what are those risks? What does it mean to not be fully literate in a society? And what are the disadvantages of that? And there are great ones. The term fake news 
is a term fake news. Is that the risk? It's become a part of popular culture. People say when you say something, and even in my classroom, I teach high school. Oh, miss, that's fake news. Right. So, so fake news is, is an incredible, when you look at the proliferation of the term fake news since the 2016 election, it's kind of shocking that I, th- I don't think anyone in the media literacy community realized that that would be the thing that brought media literacy into the cultural conversation, but it certainly did. And we know that fake news and, and the concept of fake news has been around ever since there was any news. But the idea that it's kind of now, it's almost slang in some ways that, that you know, certainly the younger generation uses it whenever they don't believe anything. And it's, it's kind of this... I don't want to say this joke, but this phrase, this this silly phrase that we use uh, sometimes. So I think what's important to note about the conversation around fake news is that it has opened up a really important conversation in our culture, right? And And the conversation that fake news has opened up is the conversation about these modern information ecosystems. Right, our modern information ecosystem with our social media, with our, with the data being shared, and and all the things that come from a kind of participatory communication system, that is something that people in the media literacy community, people in the education community, might have been thinking about, but the the full kind of population of our world was not thinking a lot about that. And what happened at the 2016 election really opened up this conversation about, wait, how is information getting to me? What control do the technology companies have? All of these questions that have, are really, really important to ask. So I think that if we look at fake news as an opportunity to open up a broader conversation about the importance of media literacy and the importance of understanding our information systems, then really fake news has been a very positive thing for education. Uh, What we have to be careful about is that we limit it to this conversation. Because fake news, anyone that is in the classroom, anyone that understands literacy, anyone that understands information flow understands that information is really complex. And information doesn't fall into two simple buckets of fake or fic, you know, fact or fiction. And really, a lot of the work and a lot of the education has to happen in between those two things, uh, issues of bias and issues of agenda, issues of all the nuance that goes into understanding information, opinion, all of these things are really what we want to get down to in the classroom, uh, what we want people to understand. If we simply limit it to if we limited information simply to what is true and what is false, we're not, we're not learning about information. We're doing a very, very surface, very shallow look at information, which is why when we ask ourselves, what do we want? Like, what do we want education to be? To me, it has to be more than just not wanting to be tricked, right? Or not, like, we want to understand it in a different way. We want to understand the nuance. We want to understand bias. We want to understand the agenda. We want to understand it on a deeper level than simply is this fact or fiction. Understanding different viewpoints are represented by different media and different motivations. It's very confusing for our students. I teach social studies. And even though I'm in the NYC schools tech group, I'm not a tech teacher. I and but media in and technology go into every subject area. And I place a huge emphasis in in my course in teaching about multiple viewpoints. And one one thing that I always find difficult to, to teach students is the criteria for a quality resource. So in social studies, we call it sourcing. But my question to you is, how do you decide what a quality resource is? And how do you teach that? Uh, our audience, a lot of our audience who hopefully are listening are, are educators. So words of advice on that as well as a follow-up. Well, I think what's really great about um, the past two years in terms of, uh, especially for social studies teachers like yourself, is that there's really, really a plethora of 
information out there that is helpful for teachers and an amazing amount of resources. I find that the struggle is not that the resources aren't there. It's that how do we get the resources into the classroom? How do we let teachers like yourself know about the resources? Like how do you get the information? Back to my organization. So we are an umbrella organization and we really you know, we don't have kind of a stamp or an endorsement of, you know, this is quality, this is quality media literacy, but we just within our community and within our organizational partner model, you'll see really, really strong work being done. So when I think specifically around this issue of fake news, I think of the museum, I think of the News Literacy Project, the Center for News Literacy, Newsomatic is a uh, online newspaper for for students, uh, younger students, third to fifth grade. There are so many organizations like KQED Teach in San Francisco that have unbelievable resources, common sense education. Like it, there is so much work out there that has been done. And really the goal is like, how can we get it to teachers like you, the teachers that are listening to the podcast? So it really, um, you know, I always look for making sure that teachers have the support they need to uh, to use the resources. So when I think of quality resources, it's really when the organization can connect directly to the teacher to support the teacher in using the resource, right? Like to me, you have to put an investment not only in the resource itself, but in the training for the resources. So my my short recommendation is go to our website, namely.net, and look at our organizational partners and look at the work that they're doing. The other thing, going back to the beginning, is we are a free organization. So if you sign up for membership uh, at namely.net, there's like a join now button, you'll be on our mailing list and uh, our email list, I should say. And we send out monthly uh, newsletters that include new resources, new opportunities for teachers, new learning opportunities, professional development opportunities, conferences. You know, we send out information that would be helpful to teachers, including, you know, new videos that are out or new discussion guides, all of this stuff. So I would highly suggest uh, if, if you're interested in bringing media literacy resources into the classroom to become a member of the organization because you'll have access to a lot of the the work as it comes out. So here's a call to action. Uh, go to N-A-M-L-E dot net, correct? Yes. And subscribe uh, and, and also become a member. It's free. Media Literacy Week is an annual initiative that's nationwide. And this year it's November 5th through 9th. And that's an uh, opportunity for teachers, organizations, schools to do media literacy, uh, do special events, special screenings, special conversations, use new resources in the classroom. You can go to medialiteracyweek.us to find out more. And that, what we love about media literacy is it really is a grassroots effort. I should say Media Literacy Week is a grassroots effort. And there are organizations all over the country. We had 225 partners, national partners last year. We're hoping to have close to 300 this this year and it really is a it really an amazing opportunity for people that care about media literacy to highlight the work what is one of your concerns as a parent a parenting tool you use in the home to support your own children being good digital citizens well, I think that one thing not surprising uh, is that we have a lot of dialogue in my home about media and about uh, everything from the news to entertainment media to what we're listening to music wise, what we're watching TV wise, what we're seeing on our social media feeds. So we have a very kind of open relationship about media in the home and I think what's most important, it's an interesting way that you asked the question. So you asked about the concerns. And what's funny is my biggest concern is that we spend too much time talking about the concerns <laughs> and not enough time talking about what an incredible time to be alive this is and what incredible tools that are in 
the hands of our young people. Um, I look, my kids are both uh, musical and they're both performers and what they're able to create on their computers with their friends, you know, is just unreal, like the technology that's available to them. And so I think that I, if I could ask for for one shift is that we change the narrative in our culture about kids and technology so that we look at it as starting from a place of opportunity in which we have to understand the risks as opposed to the other way around. Right now, we focus so much on the risk that we're losing sight of what incredible tools they are. So my recommendation always to parents, and we have actually, we have a parent guide to media literacy on our website. It's a, you know, all of our stuff is free. You can download it. And we wanted to create a really, really simple guide. And the guide gives parents literally one tip. And the one tip is teach your kids to ask questions. So if you can create a culture in your home of inquiry where at the dinner table from the very youngest ages you're asking questions and you're being curious uh, that will that will um, instill in them the ability and the desire to be thinking uh, thinking critically and to be asking questions and that is something that I think is really important to st instill at a very young age um, that everything we consume everything we create um, should be questioned, right? It should, oh, we should always be asking questions. So I like that you put a positive spin on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that we teach, we teach safety, but we also should encourage creativity, enable their inquiry and curiosity and use all these innovation tools and hopefully be in, instead of just consumers, creators. Yes, well, the definition of media literacy didn't always include the word create because when the history of communication for much of human history was a top-down system, right? And it wasn't until the advent of social media where we all started to participate in this communication systems. And that that participatory culture is something that we're still is a, very, very young, and B, we really have not figured it out yet, right? And a lot of what we're seeing now, even just looking at, uh, if you just look at just the conversation around Facebook and data and privacy, these are all things that make sense to be talking about now because we, we pretty much, for about a decade, didn't think too much about the consequences of these systems on a, in a cultural way. Certainly scholars were thinking about it for sure. So I think that we have, um, we have to recognize that this change to being content creators to participating is very, very new. And so there are a few, you know, a few kinks in the harbor, like we gotta figure this out, but we have to really do it together. And one other point that I want to make about safety kind of versus empowerment. So I'm not saying that, you know, safety is really important. And obviously we want our kids, especially our young kids, to learn how to be safe. But I think that there's kind of a philosophy that's growing, which is education is safety, right? So educating is if we really truly educate our kids, they will be safer, right? And that will happen. Um, so it isn't so much about limiting, it isn't so much about, uh, you know, scaring them, but really teaching them. And so it, we ask ourselves, if we ask ourselves the question, like, do we want our kids to survive in this world? Or do we want them to thrive? And I think we really have to we have to want them to thrive. Like it's not just about survival. It's about more than that. And we should want more than that for our kids. Definitely. Lots of food for thought here. Is there anything else that you want to share with us? Uh, well, I just, I just want to say to teachers that, you know, the work that teachers do and librarians do every single day is really just beyond phenomenal. And organizations like mine are really, really trying to do what we can to help get resources into your hands. And so 
you know, I just want to reiterate to join our organization, get involved and let us know what you need. You know, let, let the organizations that you join and the education organizations know what, what your challenges are, what you need. And, and then hopefully organizations like us can get funding to support that. Right. And, and we know how hard it is to just manage a classroom in general, but and uh, all the things that you have to do, the idea that you have to do this while these information systems and media environment and technology changes year by year, it's very daunting. So I hope that we can be of assistance to teachers. So please become part of our network. Thank you as uh, speaking on behalf of all teachers, because <laughs> obviously I do. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, at least in this respect, uh, thank, you, thank you for your support of, of teachers and soliciting our help with helping you. It's like a Jerry Maguire moment. Help me to help you. Exactly. Please well, help us. Michelle, it's been such a pleasure. I really appreciate your time. I get to see you during Media Literacy Week. Are you going to be around? I'm I am going to be actually, there's two professional development days, one mm -hmm. happening at um, City Field with the Library Services Department department and then one uptown with the kind of digital citizenship world. So I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be visiting both of those on that day. I'll um, be there. And yeah, that's great. And then more information will be available on medialiteracyweek.us. So okay. check it out for sure. Interested in learning more? Join us for the NYC Schools Tech Summit on Digital and Media Literacy, which will be held at the Harlem Renaissance Center on Election Day, November 6th, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It can be hard to sort through all the sites and materials to determine what really works for your school and your classroom. Attendees will hear straight from each provider's mouth about why their resource may be right. Providers will make their case via a presentation, a participation in a panel discussion, and hands-on demos. The day will provide a perspective of current and emerging curriculum trends, directions, and best practices as seen in the classrooms throughout the city. Supporting students with digital and media literacy instruction isn't just the right thing to do, it's required for New York City public schools. In accordance with federal and state regulations, every school must educate students in grades K-12 to about appropriate online behavior, including responsible use of social networking websites and cyberbullying awareness. To find out more about this and all learning opportunities, visit the show notes or the training tab of our website at schools.nyc.gov slash tech. You must log on with your NYC DOE email credentials. Throughout the year, tech-minded educators should know about the following dates. Media Literacy Week is November 5th through 9th. Hour of Code is December 3rd through 9th. CS Education Week is December 3rd through 9th as well. Safer Internet Day is Tuesday, February 5th. NYC's Respect for All Week is February 11th through the 15th of 2019. And Digital Learning Day is Thursday, February 28th, 2019. Thanks for listening to Episode 5 of the New York City Schools Tech Podcast. Episode 6 will be the third part of our series on media literacy. In the next segment, I will share highlights and insights from the NYC Schools Tech Summit on Digital and Media Literacy, which will be held at the Harlem Renaissance Center on Election Day, November 6th. I'm Nancy Reback Altadonna, and I'm thrilled to be the host of the NYC Schools Tech Podcast, which is here to amplify innovative practices for NYC Schools Tech and inspire others in NYC and beyond. For questions about this podcast, please go to the NYC Schools Tech blog, or you may email me directly at nycschoolstechpodcast at gmail.com. NYC Schools Tech would like to leave you with final thoughts. Work hard and be nice, and take care of your eyes and your body. For every 30 seconds that you're looking at a blue screen, stand up, stretch, 
and look away for at least 30 seconds. All right, we're just looking out for you.